Lesson two of good news for you. God's solution for man's problem. Why God does what he does. In lesson one, we learn that a person's most serious problem is sin. In this lesson, we will come to understand about God's solution for man's problem. Let us begin lesson two and read John 16, 9. They are wrong about sin because they do not believe in me. We learn from John 16, 9 that sin is not believing, obeying, trusting, or placing confidence in Christ. Simply put, this is the sin of unbelief. Belief in the Greek is meaning absolute confidence, trust, reliance, and heartfelt obedience in our object of faith, which is Christ. Therefore, unbelief could be described as disobedience. Sin here means failing to meet God's revealed moral, ethical, and ritualistic standards, not man's. The Word of God reveals to us the will of God for our lives. And as believers, we should seek the will of God in our lives. Let's read John 8, 24. That is why I told you that you will die in your sins, and you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am who I am. Jesus said, that a person who does not believe in him will die in their sins. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We find that this death refers to the second death, which is eternal separation from God. When we read in Revelations 21.8, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We will find the description and the destiny of those who face the second death in this scripture. Now, what is God's attitude towards sinners? Let's look at Romans 5, 8 to find the answer. But God has shown us how much he loves us. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. Yes, God loves his creation, and he loves you even though you may be in sin. However, God does not want you to remain in sin, and he has made a way of salvation for us through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that through faith in Christ, we could find God's saving grace. It's important to note that Jesus was called a friend of sinners. Instead of isolating himself from them, he searched for them, as believers should do today. He does not want them to remain in sin, but to overcome sin and find not only life, but life in abundance. Now let's look at John 3, 16. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. According to John 3, 16, what did God do to show his love for sinners? He gave his only son so that Everyone who believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ died for sins once and for all, a good man on behalf of sinners in order to lead you to God. He was put to death physically, but made alive spiritually. Now the term once for all in the above scripture is not in contrast to two or three times. The Greek word in this is napax, meaning a perpetual validity that needs no repeating. In other words, the work that Christ has done to win our salvation is done once 
for all people and once for all time. Let's look right now at John 129. The next day, John saw Jesus coming to him and said, There is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world in the scripture text. In the Old Testament, a perfect lamb, a young sheep without any defect, was killed and sacrificed as an innocent substitute to pay for the sins of the people. This was a symbol of Jesus Christ, the true Lamb of God, who was later to come into the world. From God's Word, read the story of the death of Christ, God's solution for man's sin problem. Let's read John 19, 1 through 37, and I encourage you, if you have a Bible, to open your text up to John 19, 1 through 37. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him whipped. The soldiers made a crown of thorny branches and put it on his head. Then they put a purple robe on him and came to him and said, Long live the king of the Jews. And they went up and slapped him. Pilate went back out once more and said to the crowd, Look, I will bring him out here to you to let you see that I cannot find any reason to condemn him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Look, here is the man. When the chief priest and the temple guard saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, You take him then and crucify him. I find no reason to condemn him. The crowd answered back, We have a law that says he ought to die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. He went back into the palace and asked Jesus, Where do you come from? But Jesus did not answer. Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Remember, I have the authority to set you free and also to have you crucified. Jesus answered, You have authority over me only because it was given to you by God. So the man who handed me over to you is guilty of a worse sin. When Pilate heard this, he tried to find a way to set Jesus free. But the crowd shouted back, If you set him free, that means you are not the emperor's friend. Anyone who claims to be a king is a rebel against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he took Jesus outside and sat down on the judge's seat in the place called the Stone Pavement. In Hebrew, the name is Gabbatha. It was then almost noon of the day before Passover. Pilate said to the people, Here is your king. They shouted back, Kill him! Kill him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Do you want me to crucify your king? The chief priest answered, The only king we have is the emperor. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took charge of Jesus. He went out, carrying his cross, and came to the place of the skull. As it is called in Hebrew, it is called Golgotha. There they crucified him. And they also crucified two other men, one on each side, with Jesus between them. Pilate wrote a notice and had it put on the cross. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, is what he wrote. Many people read it because the place where Jesus was crucified was not far from the city. The notice was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. The chief priest said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written stays written. After the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier. And they also took the robe, which was made of one piece of woven cloth without any seams in it. The soldiers said to one another, Let's not tear it. Let's throw dice to see who will get it. This happened in order to make the scripture come true 
they divided my clothes among themselves and gambled for my robe. And this is what the soldiers did. Standing close to Jesus' cross were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there. So he said to his mother, He is your son. Then he said to the disciple, She is your mother. From that time, the disciple took her to live in his home. The death of Jesus, Jesus knew that by now everything had been completed. And in order to make the scripture come true, he said, I am thirsty. A bowl was there full of cheap wine. So a sponge was soaked in wine and put on a stalk of hyssop and lifted up to his lips. Jesus drank the wine and said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Then the Jewish authorities asked Pilate to allow them to break the legs of the men who had been crucified and to take the bodies down from the crosses. They requested this because it was Friday, and they did not want the bodies to stay on the crosses on the Sabbath, since the coming Sabbath was especially holy. So the soldiers went and broke the legs of the first man and then of the other man who had been crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw he was already dead. So they did not break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, plunged his spear into Jesus' side, and at once blood and water poured out. The one who saw this happen has spoken of it, so that you also may believe. What he said is true, and he knows that he speaks the truth. This was done to make the scripture come true. Not one of his bones will be broken. And there's another scripture that says, people will look at him whom they pierced. Yes, this was God's solution for man's sin problem. The Lamb of God died for your sins and mine. If we accept him dying for us, then we too will die unto our sinful self and live as a new creation in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's look right now at John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming to him and said, There is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why did Jesus die on the cross? He died to take away the sin of the world. I want you to notice that the sin here is singular. It is the sin of unbelief. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, our Messiah, will not do anyone any good unless you believe. By placing your confidence, your faith, your life in the finished work that Christ has already brought about. Now, looking at John 19, 4, Pilate went back out once more and said to the crowd, Look, I will bring him out here to you to let you see that I cannot find any reason to condemn him. When Jesus was on trial, he was not found guilty of any sin. He was sinless. Let's look at our next scripture to understand the type of death found in John 19, 17, and 18. He went out carrying his cross and came to the place of the skull. As it is called in Hebrew, it is called Golgotha. There they crucified him. And they also crucified two other men, one on each side with Jesus between them. How did Jesus die? He died one of the worst deaths anyone could ever imagine. They crucified him on the cross. And they crucified two other men, one on each side of him. And trying to understand why Jesus would give his life for sinners, we only need to look at the scripture text 
John 15, 12, and 13. My commandment is this, love one another just as I have loved you. The greatest love you can have for your friends is to give your life for them. Why was Jesus willing to die in our place? Simply because he loves us individually and corporately. He was willing to die for all who would receive him as their Lord and Savior. He had the greatest kind of love, an agape love, a love that does not require a comparable response, a kind of love that he was willing to lay his life down for you and I while we were still sinners. He died so that we might have life. Now, that is love. It is important to understand that Christ gave his life for you and I. He was not forced to do so. No one took his life. He gave it. Let's look at John 10, 17, and 18. The Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may have it back again. No one can take my life from me. I lay down my life voluntarily, for I have the right to lay it down when I want to and also the power to take it again, for my Father has given me this command. You see, Jesus died on the cross because he chose to. No one murdered him. No one killed him. He was crucified, but because Christ chose to die for you and I. In John 19.30, the scripture says Jesus drank the wine and said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. When Jesus was on the cross, the words that he used to describe his complete and perfect payment for all our sins was three simple words. It is finished. The word finished means a task that is fulfilled, completed. Christ is not only the one that had to complete or fulfill the task. You and I have to complete a task as well. Look at 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You see, there is a crown of righteousness laid up for those who have fought the good fight, who have finished the race and kept the faith. Now, if we look at John 29, they still did not understand the scriptures, which said, that he must rise from death. The great event that happened after the death of Jesus was that he arose. Death could not hold Jesus in the grave because Jesus is the absolute fullness of life. This is the cornerstone of our faith, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As Jesus died for our sins, we must die to our sins. As Jesus arose in the newness of life, so should we arise as a new creation. The resurrection of Christ is a guarantee for the believer that they too will conquer death in Christ. Absent from this body, we will be present with the Lord. God's solution for our sin problem is seen in the death of Christ on the cross, found in John 19.30. Jesus drank the wine and said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. At that point, Jesus had completed everything necessary to be the sacrifice for our sin. In John 3.16, we see, For God so loved the world so much that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. We have two reasons why God gave his son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place. One reason is that he loved the world so very much. And the other reason 
is that everyone who believes, trusts, or place confidence in him, they may not die but have eternal life. Let's read 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. I passed on to you what I have received, which is the greatest importance, that Christ died for our sins, as written in the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised to life three days later, as written in the scriptures. To see these three things of great importance concerning Christ, it should affect how you see Christ, that Christ died for our sins, that Christ was buried, and that Christ was raised to life three days later. All for you, my friend. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 10 through 12, because Jesus did what God wanted him to do, we are all purified from sin by the offering that he made of his own body once and for all. Every Jewish priest performs his services every day and offers the same sacrifices many times. But these sacrifices can never take away sins. Christ, however, offered one sacrifice for sin, an offering that is effective forever. And then he sat down at the right hand of God. Think about the above scripture. The one sacrifice of Jesus Christ has taken away the sin of those who would believe. This one sacrifice is effective forever by placing your faith in him and following him all the days of your life. Also found in Hebrews 7 and 27, he is not like other high priests. He does not need to offer sacrifices every day for his own sins, first and then for the sins of the people. He offered one sacrifice once and for all when he offered himself. We see that Jesus offered one sacrifice once for all. Another way to put it, at once and once for all. It is a gift that keeps on giving. In conclusion, let's read John three sixteen through 18. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only son, so that everyone who would believe in him may not die, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to be its judge, but to be its savior. Those who believe in the son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only son. From these verses, we learn that God has given his son Jesus to die for us. Also, we learn that a person must believe in the Son, Jesus Christ, in order to have eternal life. Before going to the next lesson, I would like for you to memorize and ponder Romans 5, 8. But God has shown us how much he loves us. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. 